Morning, everybody. I, thank you. Um, I think those of you at the far perimeter will will find that the viewing is better towards towards the center. Uh, but you may make your own choices, of course. Um, we are um, here to follow up on a on a conversation that we started a year ago uh, with a webinar sponsored by Building Green, which included uh, myself and uh, Tristan Roberts and four attorneys talking about the topic of the legal issues surrounding transparency and disclosure. I'm pleased today to have two of those uh, distinguished attorneys back with me, um, both of whom are, uh, have been trained as architects and as attorneys and are practicing uh, within large prominent practices. Brody Stevens from Perkins and Will and Craig Williams. <laughs> Brody's fan club is here. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate okay. It. Now everybody has got to cheer for Craig, or yeah, I'm yeah. totally and, get hit in the head. And Craig Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thanks, Brody. <laughs> from HKS. Uh, and I'm, I'm Russ Perry from Smith Group JJR. <laughs> We're getting off to a good start here. <laughs> thank, thank you all so much. Um, in, in, in the last year, there's been a, a, a rush of activity around transparency and disclosure. Uh, and the, the AIA is now engaged in the conversation and looking at, uh, at position statements, uh, looking at, at guidance for practice, and potentially looking at how this might influence the documents over, over time. Um, Today we want to dive a little deeper into some of the some of the the, uh, uh, the legal constructs around this conversation. Things that we as architects don't uh, spend a lot of time thinking about, and it really I think will inform uh, the conversation. So we'll we'll be spending some time doing that. Um, we are going to use polling today, and so I'd like to, to pull up the first polling question just to get everybody used to using the, the technology. So the question is, uh, do you have in-house counsel? Uh, so this is not particularly relevant, it's just to, to see if you can actually do this. Um, and there is a, a number that you dial 2233, if I recall, 22. Three, three, three. Um, it'll it'll come up in a second. In the meanwhile, so our our agenda for the for today is that uh, that we're going to uh, talk. Uh, we're going to ask Craig to talk about the uh, the standard of care, and then Brody is going to talk about hazard and risk, followed by a discussion of data and duty, uh, and then Craig is going to introduce some uh, some thoughts from his Beacon case, which is really interesting in regard to data and duty. And then Brody will finish up with the precautionary principle. Then we will go into an engagement with you all. So um, where is our first poll? There we go. Here we go. So 22333 dial, 248136 for yes, and then Follow the instructions there, just to see if you all can do it. Can I get my? I need to vote on the. Well, I don't know if we'll <laughs> you, do that. You, you want to vote? <laughs> um, so um, here are learning objectives. We talked about the uh, the agenda there for a minute. We're going to have another poll where we are going to ask you what your greatest anxiety around this issue is. And you're going to have two choices in, in that poll, and that will guide us as we go into the, into the questions and to the discussion. So let's see how, how we did here. A lot of people with in-house counsel. So this is a good time for Brody to tell us that what you hear up here does not constitute legal advice. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Russ, absolutely. Uh, you know, what we're going to be talking about today is um, legal principles primarily. We're not applying those legal principles to any particular set of facts. And so we're exploring, you know, the, out, the, the, the parameters of how the law may 
uh, apply again in, in the broadest of legal principles. So we're not constantly, what, what we're saying is not legal advice because it's not applied to a particular set of facts. Great. And you have friends in the room. There are only four people here um, who can't imagine why on earth we would want to have an attorney in the uh, office. Well, there's five. Five. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's, let's put this conversation quickly into context. Um, as early as, as version two, we had a substance, in this case formaldehyde, identified effectively as a red list material within, within LEAD, treated as a hazard. Uh, and that has set the context for a lot of discussions that have gone on since. In 2009, uh, Perkins and Will, uh, presumably with Brody's knowledge and consent, uh, <laughs> put up on its website a, 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 dis a very good discussion of the precautionary principle and a, a list of, uh, of chemicals of concern with a discussion of how those fit within the uh, uh, building materials. And that's, that's still on the site, and when you click through the questions, every time you say yes before you get to the discussion, Brody smiles a little broader because it, it protects uh, uh, Perkins and Will, um, they've taken a very courageous stand on all of this. A couple and of I years, wrote all of those disclaimers. <laughs> so. A couple of years later, uh, we piloted the HPD. I'm on the board of the HPD Collaborative. Uh, rolled out the uh, uh, the first version at Greenbuild, and then <clears throat> letters started coming out from the industry uh, to the industry from architects and designers saying, uh, "Please engage." in a conversation with us about um, material in ingredients, material constituents. And the first letter that came out came from HKS, uh, again, presumably with, with uh, Craig's uh, knowledge. Uh, Glad all over it. Um, that led to a lot of us doing the same thing. Um, so uh, that has been an important part of this conversation. We had our, our webinar in 2013 and now V4 has been launched, of course, with uh, uh, disclosure as one of its, its principal pieces. So let's roll over into a discussion of the standard of care so that you have a, uh, uh, some common language here around this topic. Craig? Sure. Uh, well, the, the standard of care, I'm sure most everyone in the room or almost everyone has heard that phrase used in connection with the practice of architecture it also applies to practice of medicine, pharmacy, law. Uh, it applies to how you uh, are, are judged when you driving your car. Any form of human endeavor has a standard of care. And the standard of care that applies to all forms of human endeavor is the average. You as an architect or as a driver of a car or I me mean, as an architect or an attorney have, an, uh, have a duty to act as any other similarly situated person practicing the same or doing the same kind of thing in the same general area. So for architects, that would be you have a duty. And for, let me ask, I don't know if how many architects may are in the room. How many people are architects or practice architecture? And what about engineers? Engineers, same for engineers. So uh, other- any, any attorneys in the room? Any attorneys? Oh, so that's the four. I thought they. I thought they. Were, <laughs> <laughs> I thought attorneys were excluded from this. Uh, so that's the standard of care. What what an architect would do under the same or similar circumstances. Um, I think is there a, the next slide? Do we have another slide on this? No. No. Is this no. it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the other slide I was thinking of was was uh, earlier on. We had a slide that that uh, gave a quote from the Texas Supreme Court to define the standard of care, the common law standard of care, which is basically what I just said. And then uh, that concept was added to the AIA uh, standard form agreements in 2007 where the uh, contracts or where the documents committee added a paragraph to define the standard of care essentially the same way I just defined it. So you can, people argue and debate what that means as applies to the practice of architecture all the time. Does that mean that uh, in, a, in a broad sense, so for example, uh, if on a project there are cost overruns due to design errors, that are a small percentage, maybe 0.01% of the total construction cost, does that mean that 
those errors should be excused as mistakes that are not negligent because uh, they are within a certain percentage that one would expect on any project. Some say, yes, that's exactly what that means. Others say, no, uh, that's not what it means at all. It means within that list of errors you may have, uh, one needs to look at each and every one individually and decide whether that particular error was a breach of the standard of care and then whether the next one was a breach of the standard of care and so on and so forth. So the arguments from, from lawyers are on both sides of that. The, arg the arguments from architects are on one side of that, which is the first one I just gave. Uh, recently, McGraw-Hill published uh, in one of their, in their October edition of the, uh, what they call Smart Market Report, published an article on that subject. Uh, basically, what is the standard of care in the, in the uh, design and construction industry? And it's very interesting, interesting if you read that article, basically what it says, and, and let me set up a little bit more about it. That article was based on interviews with, with architects, contractors, and owners, and they were asked many questions about how their projects develop and what their expectations are. And without getting into the details of all that, generally what the consensus is, and that with that study is that uh, no one expects a project to be perfect. No one expects the design process to be perfect and no one expects there to be no additional construction costs from errors or emissions. So, so the issue then, or the way I think of the standard of care is that, that uh, in the practice of architecture, the expectation of perfection is not reasonable the expectation should be that there will be some mistakes. And then the question is, when you apply the standard of care to those mistakes, what, what percentage or how many of them would be considered to be negligent and then what would not be considered to be negligent? So that's generally discussion of the, uh, my explanation anyway, of what the standard of care is and what it means. And um, of course, we'll have time for questions later. I expect many questions on that issue. <laughs> Okay, so wanted to talk a little bit about uh, hazard uh, versus risk. What, what's a hazard and what's a risk? So the, the dictionary definition of a, of a hazard uh, is the possibility that something will cause harm, whereas the definition of a risk is a probability or chance that something may happen that's bad. So the, a hazard is just the existence of uh, something that possibly could be bad, and a risk is a quantification of how likely it is that that bad thing's going to happen. So <clears throat> if we take uh, this tightrope walker, uh, if, if this gentleman and, and I were both standing on this cable over uh, Niagara Falls, we would both be facing the same hazard. Uh, that, that hazard is falling to one's death uh, to the rocks below. Uh, the risk posed uh, to me uh, is going to be much higher than, than he. Uh, presumably, I won't have his fancy stick, and I haven't walked across Niagara Falls in the past. So um, we, we deal with hazard and risk all the time just as human beings. Um, when we get in our car to drive to work and around town rather than taking the bus, we do so as a matter of convenience. Um, when we get in our car and drive to Grandma's house for Thanksgiving, we do so probably as a matter of cost. It costs too much to put all the family in a, in a plane and fly them to Grandma. I would rather drive. But we do so even though we're 67 more like, times more likely to die if we are in a car rather than in a bus, and we're 112 times more likely to die if we're in a car than in a commercial airliner. So. You know, hazard and risk are something that we either consciously or unconsciously uh, consider and then act upon uh, all the time. Uh, it, it, my, my apologies for those who unintentionally were assuming risk by driving to grandma's. Um, now, so the question then becomes, do, are car companies liable for selling cars when it's 67 more like, times more likely that you're going to die in a car crash than if you drive the bus. Is, are you, as a car company, assuming liability for the death of people in cars because buses are available? And the answer to that is no. 
And the reason is no, is because people get to, uh, they get to choose to drive cars. There's nothing inherently so unreasonably risky about driving cars, says the law, says the government, that you, have, you can ban the sale of cars. People can buy cars and not drive the bus, and, and if they die more likely, well, that's because they chose to, to drive cars. However, car companies have to make cars in a reasonable way. They have to make sure that they obey the federal re requirements as to safety of cars, and they have to otherwise not manufacture cars in an unsafe manner. So, so there, is a, there is a risk, but that risk is, is acceptable in society. And as long as you act reasonably, that risk is OK. Now, architects run into the same set of circumstances, too. When we design all kinds of things, if we design a horizontal surface uh, made of a solid material outside of a building that people have to transit and to get into a building in a in a northern climate, we are creating a hazard because ice and snow may accumulate on the horizontal surface and people could trip and fall down. Uh, now, is that, is that creation of a hazard actionable? Well, it, no, it's not actionable. And the reason for that is because people have to walk in order to get into buildings. We do not float from place to place over the ground. And the, the, the design of the plaza, although it creates a hazard of tripping and falling, is not an unreasonable risk. And again, as long as, as I, as an architect, although I was never licensed as an architect, I studied architecture, I practiced architecture, I took the design exam five times and couldn't pass and <laughs> went to law school. Uh, <laughs> which is much easier, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, as an architect, if I design a plaza made out of mirror or polished granite in a winter climate, well, I'm probably going to get sued for that because that's, that's creating an unreasonable risk. So similarly, if I, if I specify a carpet, and this is more a question than anything else, if I specify a carpet and that carpet has a substance in it that makes up 0.0001% of the constituent parts of the carpet, uh, and that constituent part, if fed to rats in absurd quantities over many years, gives them cancer. Is that inherently, it, am I creating an unreasonable risk in, in that specification? And that's sort of the question of, you know, we have data, how do we act upon that data? So let's go to the next slide. And I want to pause for a moment and ask Marco to bring up the, uh, the, the polling slide. Uh, while we're talking, think about what things are causing you the most anxiety. You get a chance to vote twice and only twice, and you can't change your vote. So uh, uh, when, when you think of, uh, of what's on, really on your mind, vote, and we'll use that to structure the conversation later. Please. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about the difference between hazard and risk. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between duty versus data. Um, just because you have some information about a hazard uh, that may be posed to someone else does not necessarily mean that you have a duty to that person. Data is what you know, and a duty is what you owe. So let's say um, that I'm on a transatlantic flight, and for whatever reason, although this is no longer the case, I would gain access to the cockpit and there's a red light flashing on the console, and there's a loud alarm going off in the cockpit. Now, I have, I have information. Uh, I know there's a red light flashing, and I hear a horn, but I have no idea what that means. It, it could mean that the captain's dinner is ready, uh, or it could mean that we're all going to die. Uh, the, the, possession of knowledge, the possession of information does not necessarily mean that, that I have knowledge. And so if I don't have knowledge, I can't act upon the knowledge. That's the first question. But if we presume knowledge, if we assume that I have knowledge, do I have a duty? Well, OK, I'm walking down the street. I'm in a busy uh, urban environment. And there's a, uh, there, there's a, uh, a plaintiff's attorney that sues architects. Uh, deeply engrossed in a phone conversation on his cell phone uh, and, and so distracted by that that he does not see the oncoming bus and is stepping out into traffic. Do I have a duty to tackle that person to the ground or to shout out, watch out, here comes the bus? 
And the answer to that is... Or push them. Or push them. Forgot the Right. Okay. The answer is no. I have no duty to tackle them to the ground or, or say, watch out. There's no overarching general duty to warn in society. You have to have a, uh, a special relationship of some kind in order to possess a duty to warn. And that special relationship um, can either, well, can come from a number of different sources. It can come contractually. We can pretty much contract for almost anything. We can contract and assume duties in a contract, which may include a duty to warn or inform. Uh, or we may be in a legal relationship that the law imposes a duty to warn or inform. So if I'm a seller of property in California and I, and I have knowledge of a defect in that property, I have an obligation, a legal obligation, to inform the purchaser of that defect in the property. Otherwise, I'm in violation of law. So if there, there, there may be other legal relationships. But what happens if there's no contract and there's no imposed legal relationship between a party? And that's the, that's the Carvalho case, the New Jersey case, the, the unshored trench case. Now, generally, architects are not responsible for site safety. Uh, AIA has made that very clear for many years in its documents. Case law has said that that's the case. And in, in the Carvalho case is pretty much the first case, if not the very first case, that found liability to an architect because of a site safety, uh, in this case, fatality. Uh, architect was on site, had been on site for a long period of time, knew that there was uh, a trench collapse that had occurred in another location on the same site in an unshored trench, came upon a worker in a trench that was over his head, uh, and looked down, sort of waved high, and then walked away. Trench collapsed, killed the guy, and the question was, did the architect have liability in relation to the trench collapse and the, and the, the deceased uh, worker? And the court the, went up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Argument was, contract says architect has no responsibility for site safety. There's no independent duty to warn. The answer should be no, but the answer was yes. And the answer was yes because the court said <clears throat> the architect had special knowledge, special knowledge specifically about the site because a trench collapse had occurred before, uh, had special knowledge individually because of his uh, expertise in the profession of architecture and understanding of the risks, and not just the risk, but the urgency of the risk posed by the guy in the trench. It wasn't just there is a risk, but there's like an exigent risk. This guy's going to die unless you haul him, out of the, haul him out of the trench. And then finally found that there might have been reliance, that when the worker standing in the trench said, you know, that's, that's okay, uh, you know, see you later, uh, that, there was no, that, that there was a potential for liability associated with that. So when we talk about duty versus data, the courts are going to look at a number of different factors. And those factors are going to include the relationship of the parties. How close is that relationship? Is there reliance between the parties? How relevant is the relationship? Can the person who warns have or affect uh, the risk that's posed to the warnee? How bad is the risk? How likely is the risk? How urgent is the risk, which is the case in the, the trench collapse? And then they're going to look at social factors. How evil, what's, uh, what's the, 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 how evil is the person who didn't say something because there was some moral failure or overarching social, mo social evil by that failure? How much money did they make? You know, how, how, what's their investment in the, the context where a, could, a warning could have occurred? And then from a societal standpoint, just how big of a deal is this? Should warnings be part of this discussion because societally it's as important as it is? And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Craig to talk about sort of more generally. I don't know if he's going to talk about a particular case, more generally this issue. Yeah, no one ever knows what I'm going to say next, obviously. <laughs> well, uh, first I need to pull some reading glasses out, not because I need them, because they make me look smart. I'll let you guys be the judge. <laughs> so, uh, well, so where, if you're talking about whether or not uh, an architect is negligent in providing services, then 
how do you how do you judge that? I mean, wh how, where's that all? What's that, the analysis of that? And in order to establish negligence, you have to first find that there is a duty that the architect has a duty, and then we have damages and that the the uh, the architect breached that duty and that breach was the proximate cause of the damages. So let's focus on duty for, for a minute. Where does that come from? It comes from the common law, like I explained earlier, the, the standard of care. It can also come from a contract. You may contract for something that, the other, that otherwise you wouldn't have an obligation to do. So you may, have, you may not have a duty to specify uh, I want to talk about health product declarations to, to even know about that. But you may agree by contract to do something like that. Now, if you don't have a contract or an obligation by contract to, to do, to perform some service, or if you don't have a contract with, let's say, a third party, a downstream purchaser of a condominium unit. I'm going to talk about a case pending in California. We call it the Beacon case because the Beacon is a condominium project and the Homeowners Association of the Beacon filed suit against various parties, including uh, HKS. And uh, HKS was the architect of record. SOM was the design architect for it. It's a, it's a very large multi-use uh, project in San Francisco with condominiums. So uh, that case is pending. But uh, a demurrer, uh, uh, let's get a, a, away from technical uh, legal technical jargon, a, a motion was filed with the court telling the court we, that the architect had no duty, that word again, to these downstream purchasers, condominium purchasers, that our duty was to our client with whom we had a contract. And so because there was no privity, no nexus, uh, contractual nexus between us and the downstream purchasers who sued us, then the court should throw the case out because we don't owe them that, quote, duty that I, was, that I keep talking about. So in that case, uh, the, the trial court agreed. The, the, that was appealed by the plaintiffs to the Court of Appeal. The, the Court of Appeals uh, disagreed and said that the architect did have a duty. And then that was appealed by the architects to the California Supreme Court, who finally weighed in and said, yes, the architects owe a duty to those downstream purchasers of the units. Now, why is all, all even relevant to what we're talking about here? I think it's relevant because when you specify or we specify products and we consider health product declarations in, in that and, and we go through this whole analysis of what should we know about the, the chem chemical makeup of products and what do we do with that knowledge and how do we explain it to a client, do we put that in our contract or not? Uh, and what liability exposure do we have to those downstream purchasers like the condominium owners that I was just talking about? Well, if, if other states around the country follow the same rationale as the California Supreme Court, then you're going to have that obligation. You're going to have that duty. And uh, let's just take something obvious like asbestos or formaldehyde or something that people have had experience with as being maybe hazardous in the past. If you specify something that is determined to be hazardous down in the, in the future and somebody's is, is made sick because of that, and they sue you, the architect who specified that, uh, you're not going to be able to say, well, I didn't have a duty to those people because my contract was with my, my client, and that's what my client wanted. My client knew that that material was going to be specified. In fact, they demanded that I specify it. That's not going to help you because of the rationale of the California Supreme Court. And I'll just go through what they said, their factors, just very, very briefly. Here come the reading glasses. Uh, what they said was that the architect's services were intended to benefit the homeowners. It was foreseeable but that the homeowners could be harmed by negligently designed units. Homeowners suffered injury. The units allegedly were allegedly, I don't think they are, but they are allegedly unsafe and uninhabitable at times. There was a close connection between the architect's conduct and the injury suffered. And there's a moral blame because of architects unique and well compensated. They seem to fixate on how much money the architects were paid. Like, we yeah. should work for free, like lawyers. Well, and, and architectures, <laughs> they, architects get such a great profit margin on their work. I mean, you can understand why they'd be concerned about that. 
So because of the well-compensated role and knowledge, the homeowners would rely on, even homeowners nobody even knew, would rely on the special expertise of the architects. And finally, the public policy of, presenting, of preventing future harm, public policy of preventing future harm, supports a finding of the duty of care. And, and more st uh, astoundingly, they said, and this is, the, this is the important point for everybody in this room when you're thinking about what you do with a client and what they want in the project, project and how you specify products. The court said it would be patently inconsistent with public policy to hold that an architect's failure to exercise due care can be justified by client interests at odds with the interest of homeowners in safety and habitability. So what's the point there? The point is, you have a client who demands or wants a certain product, and you think, well, I don't know, maybe that's not a good idea, but that's what they want, and it's not illegal, it's not a code violation, so I'm going to specify it. But if later it's determined that that product was unsafe, you can't go to the court and say, that's what my client told me they wanted, so that's why I did it. That's not going to help you with the California Supreme Court's rationale. Can't answer that because that wasn't before the Supreme Court in California, but anything like that may, may help. Well, Brody, we're running a little behind, so a quick discussion of the precautionary principle. Okay, quick principle. discussion. Um, <clears throat> the precautionary principle which uh, underlies the uh, Perkins and Will Transparency list and, and also uh, is kind of the foundation, I think, of, of HPDs. It was originally articulated in the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And basically what the what this summit uh, conferees said was that action should be taken to protect the environment where hazards are identified, even where there's a present lack of scientific certainty as to cause and effect. Basically, it's better to be safe than sorry. And where there is a where there is a hazard that's been identified but no causal scientific certainty as to cause and effect that's been identified, why not be safer than, than be sorry by failing to be safer? So it's just focusing on that implementation of the precautionary principle requires the identification of hazards. And the purchase, the purpose of the HPDs is to identify hazards, not risks. It's, it's to say, here's the stuff that is in this particular piece of uh, equipment or carpet or, or paint or whatever. It's to identify hazards, not risks. It's important to note that the precautionary principle says that action should be taken even where there's a lack of certainty, which is very different than the standard of liability that you're going to find for a finding of negligence or a finding of breach of contract, where there has to be a duty, there has to be a demonstrable breach of the duty, there has to be a causal proved nexus between the breach of the duty and damages, and then actual damages needs to be proved up. You can't take the precautionary principle and say action on the basis of the precautionary principle results in liability for negligence or results in liability for breach of contract because they're based on totally different frameworks. One requires uh, proof and certainty in relation to proof, and the other is, is intentionally uh, better to be safe than sorry. It's a detachment from proof. Now, a breach, as we talked about, could be, uh, could be a breach of a, of a standard of care or it could be a breach of a contract term. So we want to focus then, I think, in terms of thinking about this in our practice on duty. Uh, what obligations do I owe to whom? And those obligations can either, as we talked about, arise out of a contract, and our scope defines the duty. What it is that we promise we're going to do creates the duty of either fulfillment or absence of fulfillment of that we assume. Or it can be tied back to a special relationship and making sure that we understand what those special relationships are and aren't, and we don't end up baking that into agreements or baking that into undertakings that we have with clients. Uh, 
uh, uh, fiduciary duties by way of example or something like that. So what are we going to do? We're going to do as architects. I'm talking about architects right now. What are we going to do as architects? Well, we're going to be architects. And that, that sounds kind of circular and, and pretty obvious, but we're not going to be scientists. We're not wearing lab coats. We're not testing stuff. We're not running studies to determine epidemiological connections. All we're doing is relying upon, in most cases, <coughs> governmentally published information, which indicates that there is some hazard, and thereby using the precautionary principle, making that information available to our clients as one of a number of factors used in the selection of materials and equipment. We're not warranting or guaranteeing an outcome. Uh, we're, not, we're not going beyond the scope of what our license permits and what our training uh, gives us the capacity to do. All we're doing is taking information that's available publicly and we're providing that to the client with the understanding that as an architect, making material selection is on a wide range of client-focused bases. The, client, the clients want to know how much this is going to cost. How, is it going to, how much is it going to cost to maintain? Uh, what is the, uh, you know, you, you told me that you think that this is aesthetically pleasing. Well, why? How does it relate to the aesthetics of the building? Um, you know, what is the, uh, what's the availability of this product? Am I going to have a difficulty getting it out to the site on a timely basis so I can meet my supply chain and hit my critical path? All of those are incredibly important factors. One of the factors includes, okay, you've got three different alternatives. One of them, it contains this substance. These others don't. Um, if you want to know my opinion, client, my opinion is of these three Choose these two, because under the precautionary principle, it's better to be safe than sorry. That does not mean that I'm expressing an opinion about uh, public health risk. It doesn't mean that I'm stepping into the shoes of a public health official or epidemiologist. All I'm doing is behaving like an architect and applying one of a number of factors into a selection process. So finish up, finish up your voting, and then we'll guide the conversation by what seems to be some pretty obvious trends here in terms of your concerns. But as you finish uh, the, the voting, I, I'd like you all to speculate, because we don't have case law yet uh, on, these, on these topics. Um, HPDs are out there. Material constituents have been disclosed. Um, it is available on the web for us to see. Um, does the potential duty of the architect change whether we ask for that information from the, from, the, uh, from the manufacturer, whether we put it into the specifications? Does it change simply by engaging with that, or do we, do we now have the duty because the information is there? What's your speculation? Well, uh, just because I'm thinking of Brody's cockpit, cockpit example. Um, if, if I, if I re represent to a client that I have knowledge, uh, sufficient knowledge and experience, expertise, training to know what the flashing light and the horn means, and I will tell you, client, what that means, then yes, your duty has expanded into a new area. If you don't make that representation, and I'd say, no, your duty hasn't expanded to that representation. But each, back to the uh, standard of care, uh, everything a person does, uh, the, for everything a person does, the law implies or demands that you do that with reasonable care. So just apply that to anything. You're gonna, you have to do it with reasonable care. So th th that same thought applies to that, your question, and that is if you're going to get into the area of having knowledge of HPDs and chemicals and products and you're going to start advising clients of that, then you have to do it with reasonable care. You have to know what you're doing and do it well and do it right, not negligently. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, to, to go second to, to Craig on a lot of these things, but add, um, the standard of care changes over time because the profession changes over time. We get we get, we get new tools that we can use. We 
um, uh, we become aware of new uh, benchmarks for best practice that are identified, and information becomes available in the industry broadly, which is relevant to our decision making. Um, now, you know, if you use if you use asbestos as the example, um, in in 1950, asbestos was uh, a, a miracle fiber. Uh, it was highly wear resistant, uh, very cheap, uh, a great insulator, both in terms of, of heat and also in terms of uh, electrical electricity. Um, you 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 could find and did find asbestos in a lot of products as a result. At some point in time, there was so much information available generally in the industry and just generally in the public that there was a, a clear, obvious connection between mesothelioma, asbestosis, and uh, you know, and other cancer deaths to asbestos that nobody could specify today asbestos when you know it's going to be friable and not be violating the standard of care. I mean, the standard of care is not static. It changes over time. So just as I agree absolutely with Craig that you, as long as we're not assuming responsibilities that are beyond our capacities, either contractually or by representation and marketing, um, we, we don't assume those responsibilities necessarily. We also have to be concerned with and, and consider the fact that the standard of care is not static and it changes over time. So it, it's, it's pretty clear that, that our audience has, uh, would like for us to discuss communications, uh, how we talk to our clients about these things, which we've begun to do, but also the issue of uh, responsibility and ethics. Um, it, it is also clear that Craig did a fabulous job of explaining standard of care, and there are very few questions left out there. Um, so let's talk about uh, clients. Um, what should we be telling our clients? And how should we be representing our expertise? Um, does it lessen our exposure if we share the disclosed information with our clients? Should it pass directly to our clients? There are a lot of issues that we, that we don't yet fully understand here. What do you all think? Want to go for this, this time or you want me to take it? Go ahead. Well, uh, again, it gets back to uh, duty and standard of care. I, I, guess as, I guess the lawyer side of me, by the way, I get into heaven because I'm an architect. The lawyer side of me, <laughs> that's that like four or five references to lawyers, negative references to lawyers. I probably have more coming, so just. Uh, if you. First of all, I agree with Brody in that the standard of care does evolve over time. So right now, what I'm saying is uh, this, this whole issue is, is new in the industry. So there is no case law, there's no example, there's no contract language as standard or anything that, that we can use to say, well, that's the standard or that's what your expectation should be. Basically, all we can do now is look at cases like the Beacon case and, and look at legal theory about duty and, and proximate cause and negligence and those things that we just talked about and try to overlay that onto this kind of, this kind of fact situation and predict with no, no certainty of what the outcome might be. So uh, if we're talking about the risk associated with this thing, this HPDs and chemical makeup of products out there that now people are starting to become aware of, like the, the ingredients uh, on cereal boxes. Uh, the more you know, the more you need to disclose. In other words, another way to say that is, you all have a duty to share with a client everything you know. So if you know these things, you've got to tell your client these things. You can't keep it from them. And then and think to yourselves, well, if we just won't bring it up, then there won't be a, an issue. You have to bring it up if you know about it. So if you start wading into this area of practice, then as I said a minute ago, you have to do it non-negligently. You have to have full disclosure. I mean, you, just, you can't just tiptoe in. You're, you're diving in. You can't just dabble in it. Does that start to answer your question? It's starting, but I have a sense that Brody will finish. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know if you're pressing it or not. I have no idea what to say now. No, I think that um, the, uh, the reality is that the train has left the station. Uh, you know, data, has, data is out there and is, is, um, is likely to continue to increase 
uh, in terms of presence in the industry and availability, uh, readily, re readily, ready availability. I don't think you're going to put the genie back in the bottle. And so then it really becomes a question of what constitutes appropriate, reasonable conduct as an architect, not as a not a, now again, not as an epidemiologist, not as somebody who understands material science, but as, as an architect who really can only collate information and then pass it on and say, as, as one of a number of factors, here is what we have. And I could, you know, it, taking the, the, the spectrum, if, let's use by way of example, and, and uh, Russ, you, you brought this up just before we had our conversation here, Let's use by way of example, uh, you know, maintenance manuals for equipment. Uh, architects don't read maintenance manuals and then tell the owner how to maintain their equipment. Um, they're not in the business of doing it. They don't. They don't understand it. And, and so it, it's not just a bad idea because they don't really know what they're doing. It just doesn't make any sense to do that because they don't have that capacity. As a consequence, what an architect is going to do is he's going to take those maintenance manuals. He's going to stick it in a folder. Uh, it's going to be a submittal that comes at the end of the job, and it's going to hand it to the owner and say, I've checked to make sure that all of the stuff that you were supposed to get a manual about, you did. Here you go, with no representation otherwise. Well, HPDs could be handled much the same way. You could say, you know, dear owner, you wanted HPDs. They all got submitted. I stuck them in a folder, and here they are. Thanks again. And, then, and that would be a fulfillment of your contractual responsibility. Uh, you know, going a step up from that, if you have it and you've said you're going to do something with it, then you have to do that something in a reasonable way that's consistent with your licensure, your education, and your capacity. But I think there, there have been um, a number of us um, uh, who have had the question of materials are out there. Uh, if we had looked at the MSDS, we would understand that there were um, chemicals of concern already in these materials. Now that is being formal, formally codified, documented, if you will, <coughs> by, by uh, an HPD. Uh, so we are specifying products uh, that formerly we would have known had we asked, now we have asked, and now we do know have a, uh, a, a chemical of concern in, in them. And therefore a hazard, not a risk. Correct, and a hazard. Have we include, increased our exposure simply by asking for that information? I, you know, I mean, it, it again, it, it really um, depends upon uh, when you ask the question. If you ask the question right now, and you ask the question right now in rural South Dakota or something in terms of practice, um, the answer to that is probably no, well, probably yes, probably asking for that information and, and embodying it into your, into your evaluative process may, right now, change the standard of care because you're assuming responsibility that your, your similarly situated peers upon whom you're going to be judged as to whether or not you acted reasonably or unreasonably probably wouldn't. Um, if you ask that same question about uh, about architects in, a, in another locale or, or architects that are per performing in a particular type of uh, of work, I, I I don't know. I mean, arguably, um, arguably, again, we're at the cusp of of not just the availability but the use of you know, on a much much more common basis than if this information, and so. At some point in time, I would say no. The availability of the information is, is at some point in time, going to uh, going to imply knowledge, but we're not there yet. I don't know what you think, Craig. Well, I would agree with that. I I, I don't think simply asking for it at this point uh, implies some some liability for not knowing what to do with it. But you know, I have to say it's it's. Right on the line. I, uh, it's impossible to predict what will happen because once, once, uh, as I said a minute ago, you can't tiptoe into to something like this. If you're going to do it, you need to just dive right in. So, 
I think it would be reasonable to expect an argument. Let's say that let's say there's some damage in a lawsuit for whatever reason related to this issue comes up. I think you can expect lawyers on the other side to make the argument that, well, architect, what was your whole what was the point of asking for it? Were you just asking for it because uh, you just thought it was interesting to pass along, and then so you just gave my client some bad information? Uh, I, I think you can expect the argu argument to be made that once you ask for it and it's, you're being paid back to the well-compensated architect and you're paid to do something with it, then the expectation would be that you, know, you do something appropriate with it. You don't just dump it on a client without any analysis or reasoning or, or, or research. I think it's reasonable to expect the argument to be made that you have a duty to know what you're doing, and then what a court will do with that, who knows, because it's too new to predict. But I, I could, ex it, I wouldn't surprise me to see liability found if you passed along bad information after asking for it. And what constitutes bad information? Well, if you bad, I'm bad. I'm using bad to mean you ask for the chemical ingredients of products. And then in those ingredients, there's some carcinogen or something that's going to be un unhealthy if uh, given to, to lab rats in you know, doses of 6 million per parts per second or something. And then uh, if you, you pass that along to a client and you specify the product and, and uh, it turns out to cause damage, then trust me, there is no end this is especially for the lawyers in the room, just in case you don't fall into this category or do. There's no end to the intellectual dishonesty of a plaintiff's lawyer. They will argue anything. And, you know, to their, I guess, in their defense, that's what they're paid to do. They're paid to take on a client and make the best argument they can for that client to uh, win the case. Uh, so, so how, but, how would we... Well, I, I think it's important to note that architects are going to continue to be architects. Architects are going to continue to perform architecture. The performance of architectural services involves, as it relates to HPDs and materials, involves the review of materials, if, if undertaken as a duty, the review of materials as one of a number of factors in making a selection. Um, so if there is a... Again, we're not talking about illegal substances or unreasonably hazardous substances. We're talking about things that are absolutely and perfectly legal, uh, have no prohibition uh, at law or otherwise for use in, in, the, in the built industry right now. If the architect is acting like an architect and saying, here are your options, and with that, I'd do this and not that, um, I don't know whether... Uh, that implies that the architect assumes a responsibility unless that responsibility has been adopted contractually, which is something I'm going to make darn sure we don't do. Um, so. Yeah, but there, there's another way to incur liability, and that is if you have a client who says, as part of his directive to, to the architect, I don't want any certain categories of HPD, or of, of chemicals, I mean, in my... <coughs> in my building. I don't want carpet with this in it, or I don't want paint with that in it. And so, since you represent yourself to know about HPD, you know, be a part of the HPD process, and, and you know that how to, how to tell me what's in these products, then I expect you to not specify products that have those things in them I don't want. So, if you take that responsibility on, then you need to do it correctly, or if couple years down the road, a client says, well, I, I read this article in a, in a trade magazine, and according to the article, I, the carpet I have has this product, this material in it that I told you I didn't want. Well, then uh, you may face the cost of having to replace all that carpet, if that's what it is. So there are a couple of ways to incur the So in, in that case, the disclosure is something that will, will help you to perform the services properly. It, it could. Yeah. As long as you're reading it. As long as you're reading it. Yeah. And as long as you know what that light in the cockpit means when it goes off. Yeah. Let's, uh, we, we, we're, we're running out of time, and there's so much more to talk about. And I did want to give you all a, a chance to ask a question or two. But the question of, of uh, ethics and responsibility, if we narrow that down to 
ethics as not broadly defined things that moral people do, but ethics from the pro professional perspective of AIA Code of Ethics. Uh, how is this topic addressed in the Code of Ethics today? It's not. It's not. It's not. I mean, the only way that it's addressed, if at all, is uh, thou shalt not be uh, negligent in the performance of thy services. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and that's embodied in the standard of care already anyway. And the standard of care we should take as our, uh, I'll use the word definition, as if the standard of care is a fixed thing, but uh, when defining our responsibility to the client, to third parties, to society, and so on and so forth, that is defined within the standard of care? Well, yeah, the standard of care, again, is, is uh, of course, my standard of care re goes back to uh, drawing on vellum with parallel bars. And, but the standard of care now is CAD, of these soon be Revit modeling. You know, I guess it said Revit, but modeling. So the, uh, the standard of care, it, it evolves, but it, it's basically what the average architect in the same or similar circumstance would do. So we, we have a couple of moments for questions. If you'd like to come up to the, uh, to the microphone and, and expose your deepest anxieties, we'd, we'd be happy to, uh, to try and address those. Yes, David. How does this cut across the fact that you guys are large architects, but you might have a small architect, and now there's all this body of information that a small architecture firm, there's no way they can digest. So if the standard, does the standard of care vary depending on the size of the firm? You know, it could, depending on uh, what the expectations of your client are. Um, I, I, think, I think that, well, there's a line over here. Um, it, for me, for me if, if, a, if you're in a small firm and you're, you're, you've got this concern, you just need to have the conversation with a client. And if that is their expectation, then uh, you need to decide whether you're qualified to provide that service. Or they may say, "I don't care about that," and then then you don't have to you don't have to worry about that filtering into your services. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Other than I, I think everything really depends on expectations of a client. If that's what they want, then you need to address that. Let's go over here to Mary. I wanted to ask, once you know about a subst the substances that make up a product, right, what we're talking about today, when does that disclosure information become state-of-the-art and considered state-of-the-art? Because my understanding is that becomes part of the question of liability, right? That this is considered by all as state-of-the-art information and considered true by all. Is that well, when you say state-of-the-art, I think what what you're saying is when does uh, when does knowledge of that information become so ubiquitous in the industry right. that it becomes a, a feature of the standard of care? You know, it, it is it is assumed that a reasonable, similarly situated architect at the same at the same time in this locality would know of this information, and and the answer to that question is when uh, a finder of fact believes an expert that says it is. But I think, you'll, I think you'll start seeing it in contracts at some point. And I think at that point you'll know. I mean, when you start oh, seeing yeah. it in contracts. Oh, right now, right now I've seen changes in contracts when you, know, you used to see, um, uh, for a long time, you see provisions that say, architects shall not specify nor permit um, hazardous materials uh, in the design or in the build, the build work of construction knowingly. And then it would go on to say, I'm talking about PCBs and asbestos. I'm talking about PCBs, asbestos, and formaldehyde. That's all been taken out now. So now you read the contract and it says, thou shalt keep all hazardous materials out of the project. No definition, uh, which uh, is interesting. I mean, in light of the fact that we're talking about information coming into the industry. Yeah. Gene? I know MSDS sheets don't come anywhere near what an HPD is, but when architects and contractors started requiring that the manufacturers submit MSDS sheets, was there any kind of conversation similar to what we're having today 
about those and the information that was, which is limited, I know. But, you know, was there any kind of similar conversations about liability and yeah, everything else? I, I, the only reason I'm giving you a quizzical look is because yeah. the MSDSs are, are intended to protect a particular class of individuals, and that's mm -hmm. the guy who opens the paint can. Mm -hmm. um, that is information that is consumable by the, the, uh, the, the person who is directly going to be affected by applying the paint. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, materials, uh, the, the materials risk associated with that okay. was <clears throat> always intended to be consumed by that individual to protect that individual. It was not more broadly intended to be used. So uh, the requirement for MSDS disclosures, which is a legal requirement, um, is is not something that was targeted more broadly to everybody and their brother who might you know eat the paint. It was targeted to the person who was actually going to be applying the paint and had to be concerned about what the implications of applying the paint might be to their own personal safety. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I've been told that we have one more question, so Jonathan, you get the, the last question. I might defer my I'm question sorry. because it's similar. I'm going to defer my question because it's sim similar to one that's been asked about. All right, so we go back over to Don. As one of the lawyers in the crowd, and I've been looking at this for about the last six months, <clears throat> and I think some additional pieces to add that I'd like your guys' comment on. We actually did a national search of all cases that have ever been filed to see if there's been any liability in analogous situations for architects based on MSDS sheets because they've been around for a long, long time. We found zip, yep. nothing. No, I so this, <laughs> the information is out there, and yet there's no liability for the architects. And there's a much longer conversation to be had here. But I think something that would be an additional piece of information for people to hear so that they're perhaps not as afraid as they might be from lawyers giving their discussion is, could you elaborate on why we're not seeing liability in any of these situations? We had asbestos because that was a very definable, you had one disease that was caused by one thing. If someone had that disease, you know they got it from that. We don't have that type of ca causation. You use the word proximate cause. If you could just elaborate on that, because it might help people understand why we don't see cases being brought against anyone, not just architects, but even manufacturers around chemical exposure from products, because it is so difficult to connect the two together. Thank you. Well, and that's, that's, that's true, what he just said. There aren't any cases. Um, but I think what we're talking about here is what may happen down the road with a new standard of care that may develop based on new information and new requests for knowledge about uh, chemicals in, in products. So it, it may turn out that there will never be a case. But uh, I, I'm just saying, as I said a minute ago, <clears throat> if there is either an, a, a claimed illness or you have a client who says, I didn't want that material in my project, and, and you specified it, uh, you may face uh, liability, or at least the claim of liability down the road. And agree, I don't know your name, but I agree with what you said. It's going to be tough to prove any causal connection between an illness and a product because of the exposures. Yeah, so, so final, my final thought on this, since it's, we're out of time, if, if somebody in my office came to me and said, Craig, what do we do? I'd say, talk to your client, find out what their expectations are, and address the expectations. Either you can meet them, or you can't meet them, or you hire a consultant who can meet them. So, it's just, again, you need to it's just get all the cards on the table. That's my best advice. Don't hide anything. Discuss it with a client if you're going to get into this area and just and have, make just full disclosure. Brody, final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, much the same that, that Craig uh, ended with there. I, uh, the, the, the question at the end of the day is going to be mostly about duty. I think your point is well taken as it relates to causation with respect to 
the bodily injury piece. It's going to be really difficult to show a nexus between an exposure uh, and, and a disease unless you do have something that's really, really obvious. I never, you know, I, I lived outside in a tent except when I went to work, and when I went to work, I was exposed to this carpet and so on and so forth. Um, but the real, the real question is, is the one that, that Craig has raised, uh, and, and rightly so. If, if there are expectations of the client, and specifically if there are expectations of the client which get codified in contractual language, and there is a departure from that expectation uh, in terms of what ends up in a building, uh, it, it would, I would be surprised if I didn't see somebody down the road say, I want all this stuff torn out and, and replaced because you told me it wasn't going to be in my building. So it, um, uh, my, my final word is, you know, it sounds pretty clear, right? We, we got this all figured out. Um, <laughs> This, this is this is a new area. We don't have case law. We're we're just getting into it. I think people uh, people feeling uh, like they are improving the level of service that they're giving their clients um, are doing things that they need to be talking with their clients about. And and we probably owe we not not the three of us, but we somebody uh, owes the uh, the uh, the profession and the industry some cogent discussion about how to have that communication. I think that would be a very useful tool to have. I mean, what is the nature of the communication between the architect and the clients on these issues so that the, the client knows what they're getting and the architect is, is uh, mitigating its risk so we can continue to offer these services. Anyway, um, this is a new, a new area. I thank you all for joining us in the exploration of it today. Um, and I'm sorry that, that we, we have to leave just at a, at a point when there's a lot of things yet to talk about. Um, but hopefully we can continue this conversation over time. Thank you all very much.